Hi everybody, welcome back. This is part two of my soil liquefaction lecture series. In part one, we reviewed the concepts of liquefaction susceptibility, initiation, and effects, and talked in specifics about susceptibility. We also introduced the concept of initiation, and the differences between flow liquefaction and cyclic mobility. And that flow liquefaction will initiate if the stress path of the soil reaches the flow liquefaction surface. At that point, flow liquefaction is inevitable. Cyclic mobility, liquefaction will initiate when the stress path reaches the failure envelope and uh, essentially a, a zero effective stress condition is achieved. We're going to build on those topics today and talk a little bit more about how we can predict um, before an earthquake occurs whether or not a particular soil is going to initiate or trigger in liquefaction. <clears throat> so let's define what liquefaction initiation or liquefaction triggering even is. Most engineers are going to agree on this definition. Quote, initial liquefaction, unquote, occurs when the pore pressure in the water equals the effective confining stress. And so we can introduce a new term, a new parameter to you called the pore pressure ratio. And that's um, defined as this little R sub U. And it's the ratio of the excess pore pressure in the, in the soil divided by the um, effective stress of the soil. Now, if the soil is liquefied and the excess pore pressure equals the effective confining stress, then you can see that we essentially have this ratio here, which is equal to 1.0. So if my pore pressure ratio ever reaches 1.0, that means that initial <coughs> liquefaction has occurred. So we spoke in the last lecture in part one about how we could test in the lab to see if, if a soil was susceptible to liquefaction by looking at the um, by looking at the state criteria of the soil and if the liquefaction would initiate under a given cyclic or static load and by looking to see if that cyclic or static load caused it to reach the flow liquefaction surface if it was a flow liquefaction case or if it was sufficient to reach the failure envelope for cyclic mobility but here's the problem you know few engineers in practice today have the time and the money to do this type of testing. And so instead we want to express um, whether or not a uh, soil is going to liquefy in terms of a factor of safety. Factors of safety were really popular back in the 60s and 70s and so there were factors of safety for everything it seemed like. So we can express the potential for liquefaction initiation in terms of a factor of safety, which is really nothing more than a capacity divided by a demand or the soil's tendency to resist liquefaction divided by, its uh, divided by the loading, the seismic loading that's driving the liquefaction. Now, uh, we call this term the factor of safety against liquefaction triggering. And it's a factor of safety with a little um, LIQ as a subscript. Now, wh what do we mean by capacity? What do we mean by demand? Well, what we, what we really mean is it's the lab, laboratory cyclic shear stress required to trigger liquefaction under a given number of cycles divided by the actual uh, applied lab cyclic shear stress under that given number of cycles. So it's basically given a number of cycles, what is the shear stress required to liquefy the soil versus what is the shear stress we're actually applying to the soil. Now if we normalize those cyclic shear stresses by the effective vertical stress, then we're going to develop two terms that are called the cyclic resistance ratio or CRR and the cyclic stress ratio, or CSR. So cyclic resistance ratio is basically our resistance, or it's our capacity, if you want to think of it that way. 
It's how much capacity the soil has to resist the triggering of liquefaction. And then the CSR, the cyclic stress ratio, is just the quantification of the demand that's being placed on our soil. So one of the problems with this approach is that we have to specify or quantify the number of cycles that we're talking about. I mean, if I go back and look at this plot, um, that cyclic shear stress um, is, is just an amplitude of a stress. And so uh, we have to be talking about a certain number of cycles. So what we know is that um, given a relative density of a soil, as well as given an effective confining stress of the soil, um, given some peak cyclic shear stress, so that cyclic stress that we're applying to the soil, we know that it takes a different number of cycles of that loading to cause liquefaction in the soil. So for a soil that is um, compacted to a 40% relative density, then we would say, okay, it only is going to take, what, maybe 13 or 15 cycles to liquefy that soil, as opposed to a soil compacted to a 40% relative density. Wow, you can see that it's going to take, you know, in, in this particular case, probably 60 or 70 cycles to liquefy that soil. And so the number of cycles um, is extremely important. And, and whenever we talk about the shear stress required to liquefy the soil, there's always an associated number of cycles that we have to link to it. How many cycles of that stress are we going to apply? Let's introduce the topic of the cyclic stress ratio. So remember, the cyclic stress ratio represents the, um, the demand we're placing on the, on the soil. And, or in other words, it's the load, the seismic load that we're applying to the soil. Now there's two ways today that engineers commonly compute the CSR. Well, one of the first ways is we're going to use a site response analysis. You'll recall from um, one of my last recorded lectures where we talked about site response, nonlinear site response analysis, we could do either an equivalent linear or a, a, an effective stress-based fully nonlinear site response analysis. And the idea is that for every one of these time histories that we analyze, we compute what the cyclic shear stress is in our soil. And once we get that cyclic shear stress for every layer that's in our soil, we can average it. And then all we do then is normalize those shear stresses by the corresponding effective stress that um, each layer has. And that's how we compute our CSR. So that's the first approach that we can do. Now the second approach uh, is the approach that's used by the majority of engineers in practice today. And it's called the simplified method or the empirical method. And it was originally developed by Seed and Indras in 1971. Now here's how this method works. Imagine that we have a block of soil right on the ground surface. Okay. Now with this block of soil that has a unit depth and a unit volume or a unit weight, if we apply some acceleration to that to the top or the the the, yeah, the top of that block equal to what we're going to call a max and then we have some confining stress um, on the boundary between that block and the ground beneath it then we can state that there's going to be a shear stress induced by this acceleration. And that shear stress is going to be equal to the acceleration normalized by gravity times the total stress of our little soil cube. And really what this is, is it's um, essentially, you guys have heard of like force equals mass times acceleration. 
And if we normalize force by an area and normalize mass by an area, um, and this mass divided by an area is analogous to the unit weight of the soil times its depth, which is the total stress, then you can see really that's how we're, we're approximating this shear stress. But there's a couple things to bear in mind here. The only way this works is if this block is 100% completely rigid. It has to be rigid. And so that's the assumption that we're making in our simplified method. But look, we know that there's a couple of corrections that have to occur because this is simplistic. So the first correction that we have to account for is the fact that in the field conditions, um, we're not applying harmonic loading to the soil like we are in the laboratory. We're, we have transient loading. And so as a result, we're going to just apply a fudge factor to try to um, account for the fact that we don't have harmonic loading, we have transient loading. So that's going to get us down to an equivalent harmonic loading that we would see in the laboratory. So now we have an equation that's going to look like this, where we have our fudge factor times our acceleration times our total stress, and that's what's going to give us our um, cyclic shear stress for our rigid block. Now we also know that the block really, you know, on the on the ground surface, even though that block may be rigid if it's infinitely small, we're interested in the entire depth of the soil, not just right at the very ground surface. And we know that soil is flexible, not rigid, so we have to correct it using what we call the depth reduction factor. And we use this R sub D term to correct for this soil flexibility. Now, R sub D is simply the ratio of the flexible shear stress in the soil divided by the maximum or the, the maximum shear stress of the rigid block of soil right at the ground surface. So that ratio then um, is what we call the depth reduction factor. And usually what we do is uh, researchers perform site response analysis and they take the ratio of um, the shear stress is at some depth divided by the shear stress right at the ground surface <coughs> or just barely beneath the top of the ground surface and that ratio is what they get as R sub D and so if we plot then that ratio with depth we get these kind of shape curves where right at the ground surface R sub D equals 1 but then it reduces with depth from there. So whenever you're looking at your R sub D factors that you compute, you want to see a reduction with depth. And you want to see right at the ground surface that the value of R sub D equals 1.0. So now um, we can eliminate, remember how there used to be this little rigid thing right there? Yeah, we can get rid of it now because we have this R sub D factor in here. So now we can account for the fact that our soil is no longer rigid. So now, if we normalize it by the um, effective stress, then we have the CSR. So remember, if we normalize this term by effective stress, that is going to equal the CSR. So this is the basic building block equation of the simplified method from Seed and Idris of how we can approximate the CSR um, using basically our knowledge of the total and the effective stress of the soil, an estimate of the acceleration right at the ground surface, and then some knowledge of this depth reduction factor to account for the flexibility of the soil. So um, we're going to come back to CSR later and I'll show you how um, it's computed, but we're going to leave CSR now and we're going to go to CRR. Now before I do, um, it's important to understand, oh, let me erase that, it's important for us to understand that, uh, you know, here is my pathetic attempt to try to draw the world, 
<laughs> and on the other side of the pond, uh, you know, the Pacific Ocean, the other side of the world, we have uh, the, the great country of Japan, okay? Now, Japan was really big on liquefaction research at the same time that the United States was really big on liquefaction research. Both countries in the 1960s was, uh, both countries were using laboratory methods to investigate um, the triggering of liquefaction initiation. And both agreed that, you know, the laboratory is important because we could control the stresses, we can control the number of cycles, and we can um, essentially see if a particular soil will liquefy under a, a certain uh, cyclic shear stress and a certain number of cycles. But there are a couple problems. One, how do you get undisturbed saturated sand samples back to the lab. That's a huge problem because every time you try to sample sand it rearranges itself and essentially changes its soil matrix. The only way that you can do it is you have to freeze and core the soil and transport it back to the lab in a frozen state then you can prepare it and get it into a laboratory test device uh, with its soil matrix relatively um, the same, unchanged. And so that of course is time and money. Now our friends the Japanese um, on the other side of the ocean they continued with these laboratory methods they continued with it because they felt like it was the best way to go and the best way to get the right answer. So even today, in 2017, lab, uh, laboratory methods still constitute the standard of practice and the standard of care for engineers to evaluate liquefaction susceptibility and initiation in Japan. And it's very, very expensive. Now, <clears throat> the late professor Harry B. Seed at UC Berkeley, widely considered by uh, many to be the father of geotechnical earthquake engineering, particularly in the United States. Um, one of the strengths that the late Professor Seed had was his ability to think like the practitioner. And he recognized that we just cannot require engineering practitioners to use these laboratory methods. If they do, it's going to bankrupt their projects. There has to be another way. So he and his students, uh, particularly his PhD student, I. M. Idris, who goes by the, uh, he was um, Lebanese, but he went by the name Ed Idris. And he's still around today and very influential in the uh, geotechnical earthquake engineering arena. But those two got together and they said, all right, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a way that we can evaluate the resistance potential of a soil to liquefaction in the field, in situ. And this is what they came up with. They knew from previous earthquakes that there were sites that experienced liquefaction. There was evidence of the liquefaction on the ground surface. So they knew liquefaction had occurred. And for those sites, they knew what the magnitude of the earthquake was, and they could use attenuation relationships to estimate what the acceleration was at the, on the ground surface at the site. So for what they did was they went out to several of these case histories. And for each of these case histories, they performed a soil boring and they um, measured the so in situ soil resistance. So this would be like N value from the uh, SPT test. And they measured the SPT blow count for the soil layer that they think was the layer that liquefied and produced the evidence of liquefaction on the ground surface. 
For each one of those layers, then, they also computed R sub D. They computed A max from an attenuation relationship, and they, um, they knew the magnitude of the earthquake. We'll get to magnitude in a minute. For, so for right now, we'll just talk about R sub D and A max. So they computed estimates of the CSR for each of these earthquakes. Then they went to places where there was no evidence, or at least surface evidence, of liquefaction. And they performed borings in those locations and measured the SPT resistance in the soil layers that, that showed no evidence that liquefaction had occurred from those earthquakes. They also computed CSR values for each of those non-liquefaction case histories. So we have now a database of liquefaction case histories that are shown here as the little dots that are filled in and non-liquefaction case histories which are shown as the dots that are open. Now do you see a pattern here? I know that I'm just drawing dots on the screen and this doesn't represent the actual database but I mean, this kind of gives you the general idea. Do you see a pattern? Well, Seed and Idris did too. And because of that, oh, let me erase my little red writing down here. I don't know why my eraser is not working on this screen. Anyway, um, here's the pattern that they saw. They saw that if they could draw a line that would differentiate between the liquefied soil and the non-liquefied soil, that boundary by definition is the cyclic resistance ratio. It's the CRR line. And so the idea is if I can go out to the field and do a test like a SPT test and measure the blow count of the soil in the field and then if I can estimate the CSR from my design earthquake that that soil is going to fill I can plot that point on this type of plot. And if it falls below my, CS, my CRR line, then we would say the soil is not predicted to liquefy. If it falls above my CRR line, then we can say my soil is predicted to liquefy. And so Professor Seed and his student, um, Idris, developed a, an ingenious way for us to be able to estimate what the resistance ratio of the soil is to liquefaction without having to take the soil to the laboratory. Now, when they initially did this research, they only focused on case histories impacted by a magnitude 7.5 earthquake. But they realized they had to find a way to account for earthquakes of other magnitudes. So they went to those plots that showed, um, you'll recall these plots, these are the plots that uh, show cyclic shear stress for liquefaction versus number of um, cycles. So there's different curves uh, for different relative densities. They went to these curves and what they did was they quantified or they correlated earthquake magnitude to number of cycles. And they developed what's called the magnitude scaling factor. And so this is a factor <coughs> that serves as a proxy for the number of cycles applied from the laboratory testing. And, and it, it attempts to account for the duration of the loading in the earthquake. So the magnitude scaling factor is going to look something like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, basically what we have here is magnitude on the x-axis, and we have magnitude scaling factor on the y-axis. And a magnitude scale, at a magnitude of 7.5, the magnitude scaling factor is going to equal 1.0. And then for magnitudes that are larger, for magnitudes that are larger than 7.5, 
the magnitude scaling factor is going to reduce our resistance. So it's going to give us a lower or a magnitude scaling factor less than 1. And for earthquakes larger than 7.5, it's going to give us a magnitude scaling factor that's greater than 1, or it's going to increase our soil's potential to resist liquefaction. And the second factor that I want to introduce is called the overburden correction factor. And this correction factor accounts for the fact that SPT blow count increases with confining stress. And so um, we want to correct the blow count to an equivalent stress of one atmosphere so that um, all of our blow counts are all consistent. Now there's another correction factor, which is the initial shear stress correction factor, or K-alpha. And this accounts for any um, static shear stress that's already existing in the soil and, and we want to account for. And the reason this is important, here's my, whoops, here's my Q, here's my P prime, here's my... Um, failure envelope and here's my envelope for my um, flow liquefaction service. So you'll recall that I said if this is my initial stress state of the soil, if my soil ever has a stress reversal, it's going to increase its potential to liquefy faster, right? So the idea is that if I have some initial static shear stress in my soil, it's going to make it less likely that I have uh, a stress reversal from the stress of the earthquake. In other words, the higher that static shear stress is, the less likely I have a stress reversal. The more likely I have flow failure, but the less likely I have a stress reversal and poor pressure generation. Now the problem is that all of our case histories that are in our databases come from flat, whoops, oh, there it is, that all our, our case histories come from flat ground where our static steer, shear stress in the soil is essentially equal to zero. And because we don't really have any good case histories below um, in the soil where we have existing static shear stresses, you know, all the relationships that people come up for this K-alpha correction term are, we, we can't really believe them. And so uh, most people today neglect K-alpha and just ignore it and only compute um, liquefaction CRR for flat conditions without any static shear stresses in the soil. So the final equation for the CRR is going to look like this. Remember, it's the ratio of the cyclic shear stress required to liquefy the soil divided by the effective stress. And we're going to call that CRR with this little m and sigma prime v. That means for magnitude m and sigma prime v, of um, whatever it is in our soil. And that's going to equal the CRR for an equivalent magnitude 7.5 earthquake, an equivalent confining stress of one atmosphere, times the correction factors for magnitude, for shear stress, and then if we want for our static Oh, I'm sorry, uh, effective stress I meant, not shear stress. And K-alpha corrects for shear stress in the soil. Cool. So if we tie it all together and relate it back to factor of safety liquefac uh, against liquefaction triggering, it's just going to be the ratio of the CRR divided by the CSR. And if I'm using the simplified method from Seed and Idris, it's going to give me this equation right here. So what do I need to compute this equation? Well, 
I need an estimate of the acceleration. I need um, my total stress. I need my effective stress. I need my depth below the ground surface. Um, I, and so with, oh, and I also need the magnitude of what my earthquake is. If you can provide all of these things for a given soil layer, you can use the simplified method from Seed and Idris to compute the factor of safety against liquefaction. And again, the cool thing is you don't have to go back to the laboratory to do this. So if we plot then the CRR versus the CSR, we can see a visual representation of the factor of safety. So if I plot, say, CSR with depth, And if I plot CRR with depth, everywhere where CRR is less than CSR, those are the areas where we're predicting liquefaction to trigger under this level of seismic loading. Those are places where my factor of safety for liquefaction is less than 1.0. Wow. Okay. So a couple of final comments on the simplified cyclic stress approach. You got to remember that this approach in no way deals explicitly with the generation of poor water pressure. If you're interested in poor water pressure, then it's better that you use a cyclic strain approach, not a cyclic stress approach. And the cyclic strain approach was made famous by uh, the researcher Ricardo Dobry at uh, the University of Buffalo, or no, he's at Rensselaer, I believe, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York. What he shows is that cyclic strain is very closely correlated to poor pressure generation. Cyclic strain, cyclic, not cyclic stress, I'm sorry. Cyclic strain is very closely gen, uh, related to poor water pressure generation and, and the poor water uh, and, and the poor pressure ratio. The problem is that it's really hard to accurately predict cyclic strains in soil, especially large strains like the type we have when we liquefy the soil. <laughs> you need a good um, effective stress non-linear site response analysis to do that and you need a reliable constitutive model. So I'm a fan of the cyclic strain approach but it's got a long way to go. Um, there's lots of methods simplistic or, or simplified methods that have been developed for liquefaction triggering over the, over the years. Now in the past 10 years there have been three big methods that most engineers um, choose to use. There is um, the method that was published <clears throat> in 2001 in ASCE and it is um, considered called the NSEER method. It was actually developed in the late 90s and this was the, the um, method where all of the researchers came to Salt Lake City, Utah, agreed upon an approach and published it. Um, and so that's the Yaud et al. 2001 method. Then later, there was a method that came out of Berkeley um, in 2004, published by Chetan and Ray Seed. Um, this was is, is Harry Seed's son, a uh, professor at Berkeley, retiring at the end of this year, I believe. Um, and that method was quite a change from the Yaud and others 2001 method. Then in 2006, later 2008, later 2010, because they've been continuously updating it, Idris and Boulanger presented their methodology, which is in many ways an update of the NSEER approach, but they added a lot of their own original flair to it. Um, then there's been a lot of drama between you know, the Chetan et al. camp and the Idris and Boulanger camp. 
to the point where it's become very, very personal. And that's, I'll just leave it at that. But it's led to a lot of confusion among engineers in practice. Which of these methods is the right method? Which method is most reliable? Which one should we use? And there's a lot of inconsistency in engineering practice today. Um, a lot of engineers are converging on the Idris and Boulanger approach. They seem to have been the most um, active at defending their approach. And so I'm not saying which one is right or wrong, but all I'm saying is you're most likely to see this Idris and Boulanger approach in practice. So in this class, in my class, we're going to use the Idris and Boulanger method for the CRR and for the CSR to compute our factors of safety. So what is that procedure? Well, I'm giving you step-by-step -step instructions right here. Step number one, you're going to obtain the value of the peak ground acceleration at the ground surface and your earthquake moment magnitude for design. Now you can get these from either a deterministic seismic hazard analysis or a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis or from prescribed values if your code requires it. Now, here's the problem. Most DSHA and PSHA give you accelerations for bedrock, not for accelerations right at the ground surface, because in order to get that, you have to do site response. Right? Whoops. So if that's the case, then go ahead and get your bedrock acceleration and correct it using a soil amplification function like FPGA or sometimes you'll see it um, as F sub A like that. That's an amplification function and those come from site response analyses. So like the IBC code or the AASHTO code, they all have these site response site amplification functions in there and these are our functions basically of the um, PGA of your site and um, I'm trying to remember what they're the other oh the site class so whether you have a site class um, D E or C or whatever but they're functions of those two things okay So um, that's how we're going to get our A max. That, remember, that's the acceleration at the ground surface, not at some depth below the ground. Okay, step number two, we're going to develop a soil profile for our site based on a soil boring or a generalized soil profile that we're analyzing. Now the point here is that we need to divide the soil into layers and sublayers. I prefer that my sublayers aren't thicker than five feet, generally. I try to keep them five feet or less. And then for each of your sublayers that you develop, assign the fines content and an SPT resistance, the end value, to each of your sublayers. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And then once you have your sublayers, go ahead and do a susceptibility analysis for each of those sublayers and define which layers are not susceptible to liquefaction. And this could be based on compositional criteria, which is pretty much all we'll do in this class. But you may also look at like state criteria and all the other criteria that we talked about. Step number three is you got to compute the N160. Now this is the SPT blow count corrected for an overburden pressure of one atmosphere and for a hammer energy efficiency of 60%. We're going to do that for every sublayer in our um, profile. And uh, the equation for this is equation 2.3. If uh, you go to Learning Suite and go to the reading material, you're going to see a handout of Chapter 2 from the Idris and Boulanger 2010 report that I referenced earlier. 
you're going to correct uh, your blow counts for rod length and you're going to correct it for overburden And um, you can use the relationships from any basic foundation textbook, like even your DOS textbook that you guys should already have, to correct for the other parameters if necessary. Finally, we're going to um, correct for the fines content in the sand, and we're going to compute a clean sand equivalent SPT resistance that we call N160CS, as CS means clean sand using these equations here in um, the report that's on Learning Suite. Now here's the tricky thing. Using the Idris and Boulanger method, you're going to see that there's a circular reference in these equations. And so you have to turn on iterations inside of Excel. Now um, in the past when I taught this class, I gave students raw SPT blow counts and it led to a whole bunch of confusion. So for your homework, generally what I do now is I give you N160 values already computed, and your job is just to um, compute N160 clean sand values. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, but you're, that's what you're going to do on your homework assignment. So the whole point, step three, is you're trying to get N160 clean sand for every soil sublayer in your soil profile. Step four, compute total stress and effective stress at the midpoint of each sublayer in your soil profile. Actually, I'm, I'm going to actually change that. It's going to be at the same depth. It doesn't necessarily need to be at the midpoint. It's got to be at the same depth where your N160 clean sand is occurring. That might be at the midpoint of your layer, it might be at the top of your layer, it might be at the bottom of the layer, but the point is get the stresses at the same depth that correspond to your N160 clean sand, not just the midpoint of your layer. Okay. Then for each uh, step number five, for each susceptible sublayer in your profile, compute R sub D the depth reduction factor using equation 2.8 from your handout, the magnitude scaling factor using equation 2.11, and this should be the same, by the way, for all your sublayers, the magnitude scaling factor. It's not a function of depth. And compute the um, shear stress correction factor using equation 2.10. Then for each susceptible sublayer in your profile, compute the cyclic stress ratio, CSR, using equation 2.2, and then compute the cyclic resistance ratio using equation 2.4 and 2.13. Finally, for each susceptible layer in your profile, compute your factor of safety for that sublayer as the ratio of your cyclic resistance ratio divided by your cyclic stress ratio. There you go, folks. So it sounds like a lot to swallow, and I'm not going to lie. This homework assignment um, is, a, is a challenging one. So I, I encourage you guys to get a head start, get going on it early, and um, work on it throughout the week. If you want to um, check your values with me or with my TA, feel free to do that. Bring them by. <coughs> we'll be happy to look at them. But um, I guess what I'm saying is do not procrastinate this assignment to like the night before it's due because it will take some time for you to perform these factor of safety calculations. So um, that ends this lecture. Now in the next part, part three of the liquefaction series, it's a very small, a very brief lecture, but we're going to talk about some of the effects that we see with liquefaction triggering. So thanks for your attention, and I will see you in the next lecture.